these call and response. Yeah, you said it. I, but I, I battle with doing the correct thing versus what's doing the engaging thing. Sometimes or not battle with it. I'm just always like very conscious and afraid of uh, yeah. being too worried or precious about something I'm doing. Same with like a guitar tone, like. Oh my God, like, uh, you know, the drums for Space Queen, I'm running through this old tube, reel to reel tube pre, and I have it pinned in such a way where, like, the needle's not moving on the VU. It's full going. But mixed in at 15% and mixed, on, like, a punk, uh, across all the drums, it's, like, perfect. It's it's amazing. It gives this aggression and push to it that's killer. It's like, fucking turn it up, man. Let it look broken. It's Chances are it's repairable. You know, if it's your stuff, awesome. Try not to break your friend's gear. <laughs> um, studios have insurance for a reason. But, uh, you know, crank the stuff up and try not to be afraid of it. And that's like stuff I've taken from Sylvia Massey is like there's free, like fearless recording. You know what works. You learn those yeah. tools. Now do some crazy bullshit and that crazy bullshit might be perfect. So I'm like, yeah, I like doing my overheads this way and I like getting my kick drum sound this way. Cool. Now go from there. We've got it. We got to figure it out. We know what our settings are. All right. Now let's get ridiculous. Let's throw up that crushed ribbon mic. Let's glue, uh, you know, a piezo yeah. mic to the wall, the window of the drum room or some shit <laughs> and uh, kind of go from there and just being open to like doing the crazier stuff and not being afraid or too precious about you know what you're doing because it's almost always fixable i can you know if i screw up a snare sound i can augment it yeah. and put a sample and i want to nail it every time obviously but sometimes you're, you're yeah it, it depends though right because sometimes you want you it's a song is very delicate and less is more and you know i mean i, I totally vibe with like being on the fence about something like should i go all the way or should i like let it be you know and, and it really depends sometimes who the producer is who the artist is who the whatever you know what i mean there's so many factors that sometimes it's hard to make that call yeah, and, and as a producer, sometimes you've got a really long leash and a super um, understanding artist that wants you to do it. But there's also the point where you need to know when you just, like I said, you just need to know when to get the job done. You know, you don't need to bring out the crazy tools all the time if the song's yeah. great, you know. But uh, it's going to help if you can bring that out as a, on a whim, make it tasteful, and you're kind of practiced with it. So, yeah, you know, it just kind of comes with uh, with time as you approach different artists and if you enjoy the job. Yeah. yeah. Do, do you have any tips for staying fresh and creative in the studio? Like, I guess not on like a, on like a mood level, but like just like uh, getting creative, creative juices flowing, coming up with funky ideas. I, I wish I could say I had one like major tip, like, man, always try and do this. It's a whole bunch of different sources that I try and keep available. I'll try not to watch too many videos and, and stuff on what other people are doing because I can get a little bit confused and you can lose yourself a bit, but being able to watch some of that stuff, super important. Um, being comfortable with like picking up equipment that will be inspiring, not just gear for the sake of gear, but like I've got a, a producer friend of mine named Pomo who does like massive records with like um, uh, people I can't name drop off the top of my head. Um, <laughs> he's he's a phenomenal <laughs> dude. And he'll he'll buy he'll buy gear like crazy because and uh, but use it for a short period of time, create a whole bunch of music with it, and then kind of move on to the next thing. He's not too precious about having this Juno or whatever or this particular thing because it's it's the best. He'll use up all the sounds and creativity out of this box or this new piece he's gone on gone with and keep it inspiring that way. Like he's got himself the ability to now in time and, and budget it to pick things up and experiment and shoot songs off and and keep growing that way but it's being open to like changing up your process like uh change change the process change the outcome was the uh thing i heard from um the creator of the doom soundtrack from the first uh the first reissue of doom what's his name i don't know <laughs> I can't remember. I wish I could have all of this stuff. Mick Gordon. Mick Gordon was the artist for all of it. And he had this crazy approach where he's like, you know, as a, someone who got a brief, um, he didn't want to do all the same stuff. If he started as a metal producer, you're going to end up with a metal soundtrack. If you're a crazy EDM producer, it's going to be all EDM based. So how do you approach this stuff is doing something completely fresh and doing that. And some of that is just completely changing your tool set. So change that there there we go now i can sum it up better change your tool set kids it's always going to let you make cooler things like you may not make the same yeah. thing and you need to know when you need to still make something that's consistent and, and similar because that's what's required um but if you're able to change up your your process here and there you're going to get a more interesting outcome i hate working off of um 
templates other than certain things I've created for like, you know, I've got my hip hop vocal chain when I'm tracking that stuff or I'm mixing things. I've got kind of like my idea of how I like my toms to work and I've got, you know, sort of plug-in settings. But I, I hate going with the same thing every time because you'll end up more or less having the same sound. Like there's some producers that are just phenomenal at it, but they're also getting tracks that are like already have, sorry, mixing engineers that have their setup and it's consistent because they, they've got their thing. But if you're a producer. Yeah, like the Billy Deckers of the world. and Yeah, and like there's there's processes that make them amazing. Go for it, man. But if you're a producer and you're a writer, you've got to kind of change up your tool set to make different stuff. Like um, one of my favorite ones recently is just like the Yamaha CS keyboard or CP keyboard. So it's like a Rhodes and a Whirly and stuff in it, but a whole bunch of, and then like a delay, a flanger and a reverb, like this physical, like physical knobs you can touch and songs just fall out of it. It's like stepping in front of a Rhodes or, a, or putting a 12 string in your hand or a, a Nashville strung guitar. Songs fall out of these instruments because of how they work. And when you can approach them and you have a cool tool to, um, to to make a new approach with it will change the outcome and and hopefully inspire you creatively in a different way yeah it's kind of, it's kind of, it's it, i love what you're saying it's kind of sad that sometimes you have to spend money on like gear or a new guitar or a new, you know an instrument or whatever it is that, to like really inspire stuff because it really works like having a new bass inspires me to play different bass parts having a new you know even getting a new pl- plug-in helps me make a better mix because i'm like using it in a new way like it's kind of it's it's amazing, but it's also kind of like, do I really spend money to get inspired and do these do these things? You know what well, I mean? Yeah, sometimes I think there's um I think you can make a budget for that and consider it like research. Don't consider it like you're another you know you're not an amateur buying toys. You're a pro. Like you're 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 yeah. delivering products for people. This is an investment in your business, and you can make good investments and bad investments. And you know maybe spending twenty five bucks on. Um, a mini portable battery powered reel to reel from the sixties made in Japan was a bad way to spend 25 bucks. But I know I got a crazy overdrive sound for this one track I've done on it. And like, yeah, maybe that's worth it. And then I'll sell it and get something else. I'm also just a nerd. So it helps when you want to kind of collect this stuff and have weird stuff. Um, but, yeah. but you, you know, there's, there's a spot to, to spend the money and to experiment a little bit. And then there's, you gotta be, you know, a smart business person. So there's good investments and bad investments in it. And same goes with your time. Um, yeah, I think it was Chris Lord Algae or someone like that, that says like they dedicate, I wish I could do this like four or five hours in every other week just to learning new plugins and like downloading stuff. Their assistants have it all prepped and they can mess around with things. And Ah. that keeps them fresh and engaging. Um, Joe Barisi talks about that with his pedals and stuff quite a bit because he's got a massive collection. And he'll he'll get stuff sent to him for free, but he'll spend the time to like play with it and understand where it might fit in a production. And then when Queens of the Stone Age knocks on his door to do an insane record, you know, he's got ideas kind of preloaded in the chamber to approach where they might want to go. Um, I, and, and just being, you know, having some of that stuff is really important, but man, yeah, don't spend and money it's probably crazy. true also with just like watching like a mix with the masters or, or get good YouTube tutorials or whatever, like all this stuff has a place, Absolutely. you know, you know, you don't want to overdo it sometimes, but <laughs> yeah, I, I, like but, I said, uh, I, I think you can get a little bit for, um, you know, forest for the trees or lose yourself a little bit. Yeah. You know, I, I personally, I can, you know, if I'm reading like an issue of tape op, I'll have to read it like in quarters because <laughs> I want to digest the stuff I've learned. If I read this magazine with tons of technical knowledge and tons of new ideas, my retention might really not be that high. So I try and like read them in little hunks and stuff and then try and experiment with some things. If I'm going to learn five new tips from a mixing engineer, I'm going to try and introduce two off the top and keep the other ones in my back pocket maybe for later just so I don't get too lost in experimentation. Um, Yeah. Because, yeah. Yeah, I guess that's like an interesting thing like with in the modern age when everything is accessible all the time, all this information, all this music, it's like you really have to consciously be, you know, trying to – just focusing on one or two things at a time, you know, because otherwise it's really overload, you know? Yeah, at least at least personally for me, there's definitely some people that can take on a lot and experiment with a lot of things and and by all means go for it. But like I, I just need to work a little bit, a little bit slower into adopting huger changes of stuff. It, it all depends. Yeah. It's the <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's also there's like, I don't know, this is a bit of a tangent, but like 
I was listening to like Seth Godin's podcast and he was talking about how he makes sure to get, to have time every like week or every day that he's a little bit bored because like, you know, it's so easy to, to like just constantly, you know, expose yourself to different content or different, you know, like you could always be learning or thinking or, or like finding things to, to occupy your brain. But sometimes you need a little bit of boredom to do creative things and to kind of think about something that you maybe listened to or learned about and then actually think about, oh, how could I actually apply this rather than just like absorbing, absorbing, absorbing? Yeah, you, you di- know? digestion of facts is, and, and knowledge is definitely a thing. And uh, yeah, everyone's got their own own pace with it. But just being open, yeah, open to changing your process is massive. But knowing where you need to stay really true to the stuff that you know works well. Even Sylvia Massey sets up drums very similarly time to time because that's where she starts with. And then she'll augment with like a ton of different weird stuff um, to get her own unique sounds and approaches. And her that process itself lends her to getting tons of really unique clients that want to still have an amazing end result, but are totally open to how that process might come about. Um, or how the, you know, if the, the sounds are, um, you know, weird, <laughs> you know, go for it, but they, that, you know, you can rely on her to still get the job done and have an amazing end product, uh, in the end for you. Yeah, totally. So I actually want to talk about mixing and stuff, but before we get into mixing, I want to let's, let's go into the sauce section because I want people to hear this bass. <laughs> let's do the sauce. Then, yeah, let's just jump into the sauce section and then we'll jump into some more questions that I have. Um, but we'll listen to that song and then we'll talk about how that was made uh, and then we'll take it from there. How's that sound? That sounds great. Thanks. All right, sweet dude. So I'm just going to pull it up and we'll listen in real time for about 90 seconds. So good. It's a uh, it's a great track. The song is great. the The mix is great. The production is great. So thank you. Let's. Can we just start with the bass? Just tell me what you did there. <laughs> the bass is honestly ninety percent of that's picking the right bass player. Uh, Derek DiFilippo came in and uh, just delivered a phenomenal thing. So that that all the beds, the, some of the main guitar, the drums, and the bass was all com- like completely live off the floor. I needed to get that for part of this vibe. Um, the bass is. Oh man, I can't remember his a super esoteric models. I believe it might have been his Seric. It's called the Seric bass, which is a very modern, punchy, low end kind of thing. Um, and he's using a Nobles pre, which is one of the other oh. uh, the big things. So it's this. Um, I think it's tube, but it's like a gigantic piece yeah, that's on a, the pedal pedal board. It's a tube. Yeah, it's a tube. Um, yeah, I've 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 eyed it personally, and I haven't. It's just expensive, but so I haven't. Uh, haven't gone for it. Yeah, he but. he loves it and made the investment in that. So I think it's that um, a union uh, tube and transistor more pedal, or sorry, not a more pedal, a lab, um, and that's a uh, LA two A style compressor that they build. They they make stuff where it's like. Um, 
they'll do crazy overdrives and things. I, I think they've got some stuff for like third man records as well. That's all dedicated. So it's a large part was just that. And then, man, I think going into uh, giving a little bit other compression with like an LA 3A in the studio on the way in, but we're like barely touching it. We're not doing too much compression. It's just to control it. How it came down in, in the mix is most. 